Can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay, good. So, uh, after Vitaly's presentation, this is not going to be, I'm afraid if it's not going to be that exciting, but I'll try to make it interesting nevertheless. So, <coughs> today, uh, as you may have noticed, is devoted almost entirely to this question of privacy and machine learning. And I'll begin uh, now with uh, to talk about this and focus on this question of generalization. Think about that as the opposite of overfitting. Okay, we saw already in Vitaly's talk that there can be a lot of issues with uh, machine learning and privacy, and we'll try to capitalize on some of these issues in this and later talks. So uh, one way to think about what I'll show now is uh, who should we uh, provide privacy with? And so we think about uh, providing privacy to individuals, and that's natural, but if you look on your slides, see that maybe it makes sense to pri provide privacy also to other entities. <laughs> this is taken from a Google Street View, so they mask out faces so we cannot recognize uh, cows. But maybe there's something really insightful in this. Maybe in Google they understood that you should provide uh, privacy to cows, I don't know, sand, fish, and whatnot. And let's see if that makes sense. So maybe another way to, um, another title for this talk is why it may make sense to provide privacy to cows, especially if you're doing research and cows are the subjects. Okay, so let me begin with uh, to introduce a problem. Suppose we uh, have this estimation problem. So um, we'll have an arbitrary domain, I'll call it X. And there's an unknown probability distribution over the domain X. And intuitively think about this pair F, F X and P as some kind like uh, describing a population, population of humans, of cows, or whatever you're interested in. And suppose there is a predicate, H, taking elements of the domain and mapping them into, uh, here I actually it's, uh, I made that uh, continuous function, ma mapping it into the domain zero, uh, to the range zero to one. And we want to estimate uh, how H evaluated to the uh, probability um, want to estimate this expected value of H on element chosen according to the probability distribution P. Okay, so this is what is uh, defined here. And a very natural to way to do that is to just to take a sample from uh, the distribution. So this is what statisticians do, uh, social scientists, and so on. And <coughs> so you take a sample, uh, but it's a finite sample, of course, from the distribution. You draw it, hopefully, IID. So every example is chosen independently from the other examples and with the same distribution. And then we com compute and estimate here, this is H of S, uh, which actually tells us what is the expected value of H on the elements of our sample. So if we pick a random element from the sample, what do we expect the value to be? Okay. And the natural question is, how far is this estimate, H of S, from the quantity that we're interested in evaluating, H of P? Okay, and of course we're not the first ones to ask this, this is a simple <coughs> question. And intuitively, and this can also be one of the intuitive understandings of uh, probability, like if we have a large enough uh, N, if the sample size is large, then we're getting a better and better estimate this way. Okay, so I guess this is not uh, new to anybody. 
then you would ask, the natural question to ask is how large should this n be? Okay. This is still easy. And we have this tool from probability, the Hofzing bound, saying that if we have, if you haven't seen this, this is really useful in many areas of computer science. If we take n independent random variables that take a value in the uh, unit interval with expectation mu, and we compute this estimate mu hat, which is the average of uh, the realization of these random variables, then we're getting that with high probability, the estimate does not deviate too much from the expectation, and more accurately, uh, we will see deviation that is larger than alpha with probability that goes down exponentially with uh, the size of the sample n. So using this uh, simple tool, we can now uh, answer the question, how big should n be? Uh, I'm just mapping here. Uh, this, is, this is the result of applying our predicate h on each, of each example in our sample. So this is zi. Uh, so to get that this difference is small, with probability one of beta, it suffices to take this number of uh, examples, of IND, IID examples, okay? Mm. It depends naturally <coughs> on the accuracy that we're interested in and the confidence that we want to get. Okay, these parameters alpha and beta. And these parameters alpha and beta are going to run through uh, the three hours uh, by toxin. Uh, uh, the three talks I'll give today. Okay. And so let's continue with this simple thing. What happens if we want to simultaneously uh, estimate a family of functions? So let's say H is a family of uh, functions like that that map into a bounded interval. And <coughs> it turns out that it suffices to take N to be uh, logarithmic in the size of, the f of this family H. And um, this is also uh, a tool that Katrina used in, uh, in her uh, talk about uh, private data release when she, she used a, a sampling lemma. So this is exactly what you uh, use there. <coughs> and the idea is that for each of these functions H, the Hofting bound gives that the probability is uh, beta over the size of the family, and then you use the unit bound, you get that with probability one of beta, uh, we're okay for each of the functions in the family capital H. Okay? So I guess nothing new for most people here uh, uh, so far. But do ask me questions if there's something that is not clear. Now let's modify this question a little and let's ask what happens when this function little h is chosen according to, uh, is chosen based on the sample, okay? So uh, to clarify, we have the probability distribution, we take a sample and now we apply some computation on the sample. This computation chooses a function h, and this is the h that will uh, apply to our sample, okay? So can we use the Hofting bound? So let's see. So the Hofting bound says that for some h, the probability that we're wrong is really tiny. Let's see what happens here. Let's assume p, the distribution is uniform over um, the unit interval. And we're given this sample s, and now we choose this strange function h of s, h s, to be one for all the points in our sample and zero otherwise. What happens now is that on our sample, h evaluates to one on each point, so the expect expected h is one, 
But if we apply it to the distribution, then the expectation is zero. We get as much difference as we could get here. So this is really bad. So the un uh, once you choose H, I'll use the word adaptively. So after you see something about, the dis uh, about your sample, then there is a risk that this is not a good estimate. Okay, and this is what we'll refer to as overfitting. You see, this is like a specific example where H is really designed to perfectly uh, overfit the data. Or I'll also use the term generalization. I would say that in this case, H does not generalize. There's a big difference between what happens over the sample and over the probability distribution. Uh, you done till when is this session? It's till quarter two, but we started a bit late, so you can go till five. Two. Okay. So we say that the hypothesis generalizes with this parameter alpha, <coughs> and it's always with respect to the sample. So the story is like that. We see the sample, we choose the hypothesis, and now we ask whether the hypothesis generalizes. And we said that it generalizes if evaluating it on the sample and, uh, and on the uh, probability distribution, then the difference is not more than alpha. Okay, and what we saw is that when H is predetermined, then the sample size can be small and we'll get good uh, uh, generalization. Okay. And similarly, if we talk about a predetermined family of functions, but if this selection of H is adaptive in the sense that it's based on the sample, we're maybe in trouble. Okay. So how is that related to privacy? And I hope that you got some intuition for this question from Vitaly. Um, first, you could say that overfitting distinguishes, in a sense, who is in the, in the data set. Because if being in the data set is sensitive personal information, and then if being in the data set is sensitive personal information, we get a privacy issue. But furthermore, generalization in the uh, learning literature uh, is tied very, uh, is connected very strongly with the notion of stability. And you could think about differential privacy as yet another notion of stability. It will require that when we change one input point, one input record, the outcome distribution will not uh, change uh, too much. So this is certainly intuitively at least, it feels like a notion of stability. And this is a well studied. Stability is well a notion and, and shown to imply generalization. So what I want to uh, show you today is a claim that differential privacy can be used as a, as a tool. Even if you're not interested in privacy, it can be used as a tool for getting uh, generalization. Okay, and then I'll begin uh, a, a large portion of this presentation is to show you portions of that, of this theorem and, and the proof of the theorem. I'll begin with uh, an observation that was made by uh, Frank McSherry a long time ago, that differential privacy generalizes on average. We'll see exactly what that means. And then we'll discuss how to strengthen this statement to say that differential privacy actually protects us also in a high probability sense. So except for small probability, uh, whenever you compute with differential privacy, you're getting uh, a generalization. Okay, so that's, that's a tool. So let's begin with this. We have a probability distribution. This is just for notation and so that we remember what the story is. We sample from it IID, and then we apply a computation. But remember, in the first slide where I applied the computation, it created a risk because the computation looked very closely on the examples, at the examples, and produced a hypothesis or a function that was tailored for these examples. Here I'm restricting my computation. It can still be an arbitrary computation 
but it should be epsilon delta differentially private. Okay, so that's the only guarantee that I have about this computation. And then we output the hypothesis H, okay, some function between 0 and 1. The intuition is, as Vitaly said, that overfitting is a common enemy both of privacy and of generalization, and um, we'll try to uh, capitalize on this intuition. So make sure we prove the following statement, or a similar version. Um, in expectation, if we now apply H on S, okay, and compare it with what would happen if we apply H on P, an expectation the distance, the difference is bounded by epsilon plus delta. So we have the parameters from differential privacy that help us bound this. Okay, let me uh, try to give some intuition why this should work, and then we'll work through the proof. Yeah, you see, you that's the whole point. That's the whole point. That's Here, the whole point. where you, you right. this mechanism looks at S and produces H. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe there's a way of using the notation to make it clear that, like, your H is a, is a random variable that depends on S. Yeah, okay, good point. So, uh, what is this probability over? Uh, what do we take the expectation over? So, here on the left, it's over the choice of S from the probability distribution, over the randomness of the mechanism M. And in particular, the mechanism M is the mechanism that produces this function H, that chooses the function H. So H is a random variable that uh, here on the left. On the right, we uh, do the same, except that we don't have uh, the choice of the sample S. But still, it's over uh, the choice of the mechanism and... You have the choice of the sample, it's just your... Oh, sorry, it's, yeah. H of P with respect to... Thanks, yeah. Thanks for the correction. I have still the choice of sample, except that I'm measuring something different. Yeah, thanks for the correction. Good. So, why, why should we get something like that? Okay, so consider two experiments. In one experiment, we'll be taking a sample from the distribution, okay, and an extra point Z will choose at random one of the elements from this sample, okay? Now, I didn't do anything yet I in terms of computation. Now we'll apply the computation M on, on S and get this hypothesis H, okay? And we'll return H of this random element chosen from S. If this looks a bit strange to you, because there is this Z that I'm never using, it's, it's there and I'm never using it, okay? Uh, but here in the second experiment, we are going to use Z. So it begins the same way. The only change is that here I'm replacing this element SI, okay, that is defined because I already chose S and I chose I. I'm replacing it with Z. Okay, so this is, this way I'm creating a neighboring data set. Here this is was S and this is S with one modification, like with one swap, and I'm returning exactly H of SI, okay? So let's look at what we're returning here. Differential privacy says that because I only applied M on a neighboring data set, nothing much should change, okay? So these, the outcomes here should be uh, similar up to epsilon and delta. But lo look what happens here. Here on the left, H of SI, SI is just a random element of S. So this actually, the expected value here on the left is H of S, it's this thing. On the right, on the other hand, SI was not fed into the mechanism M, okay? So it's a random element of the distribution P. So here on the right, this, the expectation 
of this value is h of p. And differential privacy tells us that we should expect these values to be similar. Okay, that's the intuition. So let's try to go through the proof. more step-by-step -step manner. And first, uh, I'll uh, show a simple proposition that will also be useful, uh, I think, tomorrow for Katrina's talk. So suppose we have a mechanism which is differentially private, parameters epsilon and delta, and the output range of this mechanism is the unit interval 0 to 1. Okay? And let's look at two neighboring databases. Then, in expectation, <coughs> m of s and m of s prime are similar. Okay? The expectation is over the randomness of m. In this case, the databases are not uh, chosen at random, just like any pair of uh, fixed neighboring data sets. Okay? The proof is quite simple. In way we can write this expectation in this way because for any random variable that takes values in 0, 1, this is true. And then, using differential privacy, we can e uh, replace uh, the probability that uh, we can replace the probability that this event happens with this event where the difference is just that we're applying M on uh, a neighboring data set. Okay, so we're losing a multiplicative fact of E to the epsilon and additive delta. And then this just turns to be exactly what we uh, want. Okay, so this is really simple. Uh, it's useful to use this when you think about uh, uh, <coughs> a utility theoretic view of differential privacy. You could think about M, this outcome here, uh, as uh, the value of a utility function, and I think Katrina will say more about that uh, tomorrow. So let's use this uh, simple proposition and try to prove this uh, theorem. Okay. So, <coughs> Here I spelled out what this expectation is. We have a choice of a sample from the distribution, and also we then execute our mechanism on the sample to get H. Okay. And uh, I now I spelled out what it means, what HS is. It's just the expectation uh, over a choice of a random element in, in the sample of H of Xi. Let's do a simple reordering. I'm allowed to do that with expectations. Okay, so I moved these two things around. And now we're going to do what in the picture happened where I replaced that element, the ith element of the set, with a fresh random element Z. Okay. So this is about a little hard to pass, and I'm doing maybe two steps at a time here. Um, so let's see what happens here. I'm feeding M with uh, Z instead of Xi. Z is a fresh uh, independent element from the distribution. Okay. So I'm getting a neighboring data set. I can use now the proposition. Uh, so I'm losing a factor of E to the epsilon and an additive uh, factor of delta here. Okay. So that was just repeating what was in the picture. And now, <coughs> uh, now I'll remain, uh, rename these two variables. Uh, note that once I do that, I could think about z as if it is xi fed into m. And I could think about xi as if it is a fresh element from the distribution. Okay, so I rename them. I'm getting this, and this is uh, what we want to get. If epsilon is small enough, then we're getting this constant 
uh, factor two in front of epsilon. The moral is that the difference is order of epsilon plus delta. Okay. So let's see uh, what we have now. We're interested in getting... Okay, let's first say what we have. We have this theorem that we just proved showing that in expectation, in expectation, differential privacy guarantees generalization. It doesn't mean that when you apply it, you'll get generalization with high probability. It doesn't yet mean that, okay? What we would like to get is a kind of a high probability guarantee. I want to say that except for small probability, and the probability is going to depend on the parameters delta and epsilon, except for small probability, this difference is bounded. Okay? This is the theorem that uh, we can prove uh, given that the sample complexity is large enough. And look, this is, there's a bit of magic here because we allow the differentially private computation to look at the data set, okay? And yet we're getting a high probability guarantee of journalization, okay? Let me sketch how this proof uh, goes. So it turns out we don't know how to directly use this folklore guarantee of uh, McSherry to prove what we have below. But we can modify it a little, and it requires some work. And let's look at this thing. Suppose we are looking at the differentially private algorithm that gets its input in, in chunks. I think about the input to this differentially private algorithm as a collection of T sub data sets. Okay, so our data set S is now a vector of T data sets. Okay? And then this algorithm chooses one of the data sets, say the second one. So it outputs its index, t. So t will be 2 if it chooses the second one. And then it chooses also a predicate h. And in a sense, that algorithm manages to do something bad if on this sub database, maybe the second one, h uh, does not generalize. Okay. And what we can prove generalizing what I showed for, for in the case of a single data set, what we can prove is that even in this case, in expectation, the difference between these guys is bounded in parameters that depend on epsilon and delta. Okay? And we expect that to grow, in a sense, linearly in T because we're giving this algorithm T chances to uh, to, to overfit the data, okay? We're giving it more chances. Maybe one of these samples is a bad sample and then they argue, uh, or maybe on one of these samples it's easier to, to do, uh, to overfit, and then the algorithm will uh, use that, okay? So I'm not going to prove this theorem. It's just too messy for a presentation like that. Um, but let me uh, show it in the picture again. So that's the uh, setup for the modified folklore guarantee. Instead of creating one uh, data set, we'll create T data sets, IID from the underlying distribution, and then we'll feed those into a differentially private mechanism. And what you're getting is this hypothesis as an input and also an index. The mechanism says, I think this hypothesis would overfit this uh, data set. Okay? And the guarantee we have so far is that in expectation, this will not happen. Okay? So the, the expected general, uh, overfitting, like the deviation for generalization, is bounded. Okay? 
Included in your notes is a proof of this guarantee, which I'm going to spare uh, myself the uh, exercise of trying to go over it here. Okay, so we have now this modified guarantee, and let's see why is that useful. Remember that our goal is now Our goal is now to show that with high probability uh, we get generalization, okay? not only an expectation. And you could think about several strategies to do that. One possibility, which is really uh, feels natural, is say maybe we can take this uh, differentially private algorithm and try to modify it in a way to amplify uh, the probability of uh, generalization. Okay, so maybe we can modify it to create another differentially private algorithm that would generalize. That would by itself be an interesting result because it would say that any differentially private algorithm, if you take it, you could modify it maybe slightly and get another algorithm that is uh, generalizing. What we'll try to do is different. We'll try to amplify the success, the, the, uh, the generalization probability, but in a way that does not change the algorithm. In a sense, what we we'll want to do is to take our algorithm, only modify it in the proof, but not in real life when we use it. Okay? So we want to claim that any differentially private algorithm generalizes. This, this will give us the stronger claim. Okay. So we begin with this modified uh, folklore guarantee. And then suppose you give me a differentially private algorithm M, okay? And suppose you also give me a distribution. You want to claim that this mechanism does not generalize with high probability. So you also have to, to convince me, you also give me a probability distribution such that if we uh, apply M on a sample taken from this probability distribution, it succeeds in outputting a hypothesis that does not generalize. It has a large difference between its value on the sample that M got as input and, and the distribution. Okay, suppose this happens with probability greater than delta over epsilon. Okay, that's, that would be uh, our goal. So what we can now do is use this mechanism M to create another mechanism, okay? Another mechanism that we're gonna feed into this modified Fultor guarantee. This will be our mechanism M, okay? So we're going to use M as a building block in constructing B, and we'll construct a mechanism that succeeds with high probability to get uh, a bad H, okay? H that does not generalize. But because it succeeds with high probability to get a hypothesis that does not generalize, then also in expectation, in then in expectation will violate this guarantee. So that's, that's our plan. So let's see how to do that. And interestingly, we're going to use uh, another tool from differential privacy, uh, uh, in, in the construction. So we will take M and create an epsilon delta differentially private algorithm. This algorithm will expect about epsilon of, of a delta data sets. Okay? Why do we want this number of data sets? Because then one of them will be probably a, a, will be a bad one. One of them if we apply M on all these data sets, then we expect that one of them, at least one of them, will have this bad behavior that it does not generalize. It outputs H that doesn't generalize. And if we can put our hands on this uh, hypothesis H, then we're done. Okay? So the algorithm B executes M on each of these T sub-databases and gets a collection of predicates. Okay, we expect that one of these predicates will be a bad one. It doesn't generalize. And our goal is to find this one. 
Okay. So this would happen with high probability. And the algorithm B will identify, while preserving differential privacy, uh, such a bad data set. And will output its uh, index and the corresponding hypothesis. One way to do that is using uh, the exponential mechanism. Okay, we have a collection of uh, T candidate outputs. Uh, for each of them, we can construct a score function, which is how badly does it generalize. Uh, because we know uh, P, we can evaluate this, uh, the, how, how far H of S and H of P are. The sensitivity of this score function is 1 over N, one of the size of the, the, the each subsample, and we can use the exponential mechanism to do uh, to make this choice. Okay. So what we're getting is that with high probability, the algorithm B outputs H. This should be H T here. Uh, outputs H T such that the difference is large, and hence will contradict this. Uh, modified fault or guarantee. Okay, that's, that's a trick. Let me show this in a picture, <coughs> this construction. So again, we have the probability distribution P that this time is known to the algorithm. Okay? Because we're thinking about our algorithm as our adversary. The algorithm chose P to demonstrate that there is a problem. Okay? We generate these uh, T subsamples, we apply the mechanism M that supposedly uh, with too high probability, uh, probability more than 1 over T, uh, produces a bad hypothesis. So one of these hypotheses is going to be a hypothesis that does not generalize. When applied to the corresponding data set, you get something different from applying it to the distribution. The difference is higher than uh, greater than uh, the parameter alpha. And then we use the exponential mechanism to choose that bad guy, and this is what we output. And two things to note. One is this is a proof by contradiction. This algorithm B only is used in the proof. It's not a modification of the algorithm that we use in, uh, in, in real life. Okay, so M itself does not need to be modified. We made a claim about M, but we did not uh, modified. And the second thing that I said, that the algorithm B knows, you can think about it as the algorithm chose the underlying distribution uh, uh, P. And this is why we can use the exponential mechanism to choose H such that this difference here is large. To summarize this, so what we're getting is the differential privacy automatically implies generalization. If you compute with differential privacy, you get a generalization guarantee. Yes? You d exactly. You don't have to modify it. It's a reduction that happens in the proof. But once you are convinced by the proof, then you don't have to modify it. Yeah. Other questions? So let's see what we have. We began with this uh, average case theorem, says that uh, uh, in expectation we, uh, we have generalization. Uh, this line of work was uh, started with a paper, I'm not sure I can remember all the names, by Dwork, Feldman, Hart, Pitassi, Rheingold, and Rothblum, and Roth, sorry, yeah, um, where they showed a similar result uh, with lesser uh, guarantees, and what I showed today is from a more recent paper by <laughs> Basili, I don't know the, the second guy, Smith, uh <laughs> um, help me, Stemmer, Steinke, and Ullmann, yeah. Uh, which is the result I, that I showed today. 
So this is an expectation. This shows that we get it in higher probability. Um, when you plug in numbers, this delta to the epsilon can be significantly worse than uh, delta over epsilon that we're getting there. And also, uh, we can prove that this is uh, uh, tight. Yeah. Oh, I don't remember. Do you remember, Adam, what they get for the sample size there? For for the the paper, paper. Like what is the n there? Do you remember no, or do you remember? That one I don't think has any. Yeah. No, I'm sh I'm not sure. I need to check it. Yeah. Exactly. Zero, yeah. Right? So there's like it's actually the uh, maximum of two terms, and you haven't shown the second yeah. term. Yeah. 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 The, the, the yeah. So then, the yeah. The second term. Exactly. That's the same exactly. So you cannot push delta to zero here because the log here will uh, go to infinity. So, but thing about the any mechanism that has a delta zero, it also has delta for any value of delta. Choose your delta and plug it in here. Okay. So how do you use that? You remember I started this with this question of uh, adaptively choosing hypothesis. Okay. And let me tell you a story on how uh, research is done in theory. Um, so suppose I, I do research about the population. I, I get my sample and then I'm supposed to select a family of queries to make on the sample. I perform my queries, I write a paper, and then I go to sleep. Um, but in practice, this is different. In practice, you don't go to sleep, but... Uh, and, and then this is statistically valid if the sample size is large enough, logarithmic in H. Okay? And this is important because we uh, did not select the queries based on our sample, okay? So think about first selecting the queries, then uh, selecting the sample. But in practice, what happens is that this cycle is often closed. So you didn't find, you didn't get uh, interesting results here. You couldn't write a paper, you couldn't go to sleep, so you looked at the... Uh, uh, you said, let me choose a new uh, family of queries to perform the data and so on. But you're tinted at this moment because you already learned something about your data. And there's the risk that this adaptivity will lead to uh, invalid, invalid uh, conclusions. Okay? So you may overfit your data. Okay? So the analysis, the analysts, uh, analysts make adaptive decisions here. And hence, there's a risk of false discovery. And actually, it's a real problem. And there's a lot of uh, uh, articles written about um, claiming that a lot of published result, uh, results are, are wrong because of various uh, statistical misconducts, I should say. Um, So, <coughs> because differential privacy is closed under post-processing, and because it is closed under adaptive composition, we get that we if we do our computations with differential privacy, we get immunity to overfitting, even if we repeatedly, adaptively query the data. Okay. And that's a tool, and um, there are a few papers showing how to use that. Um, so we can import tools that were developed for differential privacy and apply it in analysis to ensure uh, that we have um, generalization, that we get generalization. Okay. In particular, we spoke here a lot about 
computing these sum queries or count queries so we can uh, answer about n squared uh, queries on the sample of size n, something that you heard several times uh, uh, in the last few days, uh, while adaptively selecting the predicates that we're interested to evaluate or the functions if they, m uh, if they map to the interval 0, 1 and get the uh, generalization, uh, um, get generalization guarantees. And and again, using uh, the two theorems, um, like the earlier one or the, the new one, um, you can, um, if you are interested in getting uh, generalization within uh, alpha, then, then your sample complexity needs to be something like root number of queries divided by alpha squared. Okay? And there's also a matching lower bound work by, so who else but uh, 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 John that brings us uh, bad news all the time, uh, showing that this is uh, almost tight. There is, you see that the dependency on the parameter alpha is not uh, there yet. And these are a few references for this line of work, and I think maybe here it's time to go for lunch. Good. So lunch is there. Okay, thank you. <laughs>